Hey everyone, welcome to Indie Film Grit, a podcast about indie films and indie filmmakers. I am your host, Timothy Patrick, but you, you can call me Tim. In this episode, I talk with New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. He's had 17 books published over the years, and he's also written screenplays for Hollywood. One of his books, Six Minutes to Freedom, is currently being developed into a film. Let's get into it. And here we are with John Gilstrap. John, thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. It, it's so great to have you here for so many reasons. I, I just mentioned you're a, a New York Times bestseller, uh, among other things. But at the core of filmmaking is writing. And that's why I thought it'd be great to have you on and share your insights to indie filmmakers out there. Well, I'd be happy to. Hope I have something worth sharing. Oh, I'm sure you do. Now, be, before we get into uh, dealings with Hollywood, um, tell, give us a, a little bit of your, your story, how it all started. Did you, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Well, certainly, I, at the very youngest ages, that's what I wanted to be. In fact, I'm one of the few people I know who is actually living the dream. If somebody had asked me when I was 10, after I got the realization that professional baseball was just never going to happen. Um, I think yeah, at 10 and somebody asked me what I wanted to be, I would have said I wanted to be a writer. And, uh, and then the reality sinks in through, you know, when you start trying to get jobs in, uh, right after college, I realized that, um, that's, I tried journalism that really didn't work for me. That's not really what I wanted to do as it turned out. And, uh, so I ended up, getting a technical degree. My bachelor's degree is in history and my master's degree is in safety engineering. Hmm. And so that led to a lot of very interesting work in explosives and hazardous materials. And I was a firefighter for 15 years, but I was always writing on the side. So, um, you know, it's completely self-taught, which is not necessarily a good thing, but it's, it, it makes for an interesting journey. Now, now when you say self-taught, does that mean just banging out stories or, uh, did you, did you read, um, books about writing? I read books that I really liked. I read a couple of books about writing and I realized that it's like reading books about golf. You know, it's, it, they're not going to make you any better. Mm. <laughs> so what I would do is, and I remember very vividly, the first book that I was able to do this with was I was in high school and I read the day of the jackal by Frederick Forsyth which is a wonderful book. I actually read it twice. One was the Reader's Digest condensed version that we had in the house. And then I went to the library and, and got the whole book. And I saw the structure of the thriller. I saw how he was able to use uh, pacing and structure and space breaks and uh, points of view to add suspense within the, the storytelling. And once I saw that, I had the clue of now you have to learn how to write, you know, how to actually tell the story and get the ideas. Right. So I wrote three books that, for the drawer. Um, and then when I was, I think 1994, I wrote what I was then calling Nathan. It became Nathan's run. And mm. I became a overnight sensation in, you know, when I was 38 years old. Uh, that book went on to sell huge numbers of copies of movie rights in the whole nine yards. And that really put you on the map. It did. It did. And in fact, my agent called me the day after, two days after we sold the manuscript to Harper Collins. She said, how does it feel to be the most talked about author in New York? Wow. Well, how did it feel? The answer is it feels really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a title that doesn't last for very long. But you've had quite a run uh, with your novels. Um, 17 books have been published. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. It is pretty incredible. And you know, I've, um, and for those who are doing the math, that's more years than there are books, but I also did four screenplays for, for studios on those off years. So, uh, yeah, I've been paid to write since, you know, for 22, 23 years now. Let's get into the content. Um, because you, you, you kind of, 
all of your books kind of fit in a genre. Is that is that safe to say? Well, I guess. I mean, I, I write thrillers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the overarching genre. Uh, the current series I'm writing, Jonathan Grave series, he's a freelance hostage rescue specialist, former Delta operator and such. So, you know, that's kind of in... It's not, it's not techno thriller and it's not really military fiction because they don't do military operations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of private eyes with attitude, saving the world. Nice. But yeah, I mean that, but that's, that's essentially what I've always written. People in jeopardy. Now it's interesting. The, the, uh, Jonathan Graves, uh, you, did you create that character specifically as a, as a serial character? You knew you were going to carry him through? Yes, he was. I had just finished a nonfiction book called Six Minutes to Freedom. It came out in 2006. And the nonfiction book dealt with a Delta Force operation in uh, Panama in 1989. Mm. And the research for that introduced me to people and to things and to operations that most people don't get to see. So I knew that, you know, there was something there. That's a lot of research to just let it go on right. one book. So I got this idea of a freelance hostage rescue specialist. You know, when if, if you're kidnapped or taken hostage overseas, then the American intelligence community starts working on your rescue right away. Mm -hmm. And mostly, if the rescue is going to happen, it's going to happen with local assets, you know, the, the Paris police or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But there are parts of the country where you can't really depend on the locals. And in that case, it would be either the Army's Delta Force or the Navy SEALs. Wow. And in some cases, the FBI has to rescue team. And um, and the mission there is to go in, separate the good guy from the bad guy, and you go home. Domestically, when there's a kidnap or hostage situation, it's much more complicated because we've got the Constitution, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can't just, just – you have to have a warrant to crash the door. You can't just listen to what they're doing without a warrant. And with, you know, So the, the civil liberties uh, – they slow things down. They're very important, and I'm not denigrating that, but sure. the two models are are different. So I got the idea of a former Delta operator who uses the overseas model domestically. And hmm. as the character developed in my head, I realized that I had the potential for a series. But it's folly for any author to assume that the first – that any book is the first of a series, because if people don't buy the first book, there ain't going to be a second one. Right. So, and I've been very fortunate that way. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, I imagine in places like Mexico City, you know, where people are getting kidnapped all the time, there's a whole sub-economy of, of people you can hire to get them back or, you know. Actually, I know a guy whose job is to do that. He works for one of the the big fortune companies and his job seven days a week is to negotiate with kidnappers to get their executives back. Wow. Seven days this a happens, week. That is a stressful well, job, huh? It is a stressful job. And he told me that in, uh, in the druggy areas, you know, you go to the cartel areas or mm -hmm. you, you go on to, uh, some of the African uh, countries where there's all this lawlessness, the average age of the ho of the guards for hostages is 12. Oh, really? Yeah. So, huh. and this works two things. One, we Westerners hesitate to shoot 12 year olds, but mm. the other part is 12 year olds will do what they're told, you know, at, at that level. And they, they don't have that moral center yet. So they'll shoot you in a heartbeat. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you are a professional writer, obviously, one of the best, top of the game. Um, what kind of advice can you give to the, the, the writers out there struggling with that blank page? Well, <clears throat> depends. I mean, we're talking creative side or business side? Let's start with the creative. Remember that it's about everything that you write is about the character. Hmm. It's not about you. It's not about... The, in, in the case of films, it's not about the visual effects. Everything you write is about the character doing things that are important to the character. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things, I get the question a lot, what's the difference between the first three books and the fourth book that I actually sold? In addition to the learning curve, one of the big differences is when I started to write Nathan's Run, 
I made a deliberate effort to forget about writing a book and concentrating on telling a story hmm. and to tell the story from the point of view of this 12 year old boy who killed a juvenile detention center guard and, and is on the run and and to capture that sense of desperation and and hopelessness and then ultimately hope that that life can be good again. I think a lot of young writers or new writers, whatever's the right descriptor, mm -hmm. uh, they're so conscious of the act of writing that they forget about the character and they forget about the story. Mm -hmm. you know, flowery phrases and all, they just, they they have no place. It's about creating this this wonderful ride for the reader, which is the other important part from the book side of things. Sure. Uh, I don't write for me. I write for the readers and I don't tell my story. I tell the character story and in a perfect world, I'm invisible. Right. You know, nobody should. I don't think anybody should ever be aware of the fact that this is a gill strap book. You don't write yourself into the scene like uh, Stephen King, I guess then. <laughs> well, I certainly don't write myself into the scene. I'd be afraid to be in the scenes that I'm that I that I write. Right. No <laughs> My kidding. characters are far braver than I am. Now, talking about characters, um, when, when you're developing a character, how far into their backstory do you go for yourself? Does that does that help you in in seeing their arc, the decisions they're going to make? Well, I, in writing a series my main character, Jonathan Grave and his buddy boxers. And, you know, so that, that cadre of recurring characters is pretty much stable. You know, every, readers get to know them over time. For me, the real character arcs in any given book are the, those of the hostages. Oh. You know, what, what are they going through? They're the ones that have to have a complete story arc from page one to page 400 or whatever of that particular book. So, you start with the premise, and for me, it develops over time. Uh, every character mm -hmm. in the first draft is sort of a placeholder to move the plot along. And then once I kind of get into the groove of of who they are and what they have to do, then they just kind of, it evolves. I like to think of it as, and I don't know if this resonates anymore, but there used to be when I was a kid, we had a... Um, uh, encyclopedia. And in the middle, they had these clear acetates that showed the different layers of the human body. And so you start with a skeleton and then you can lay muscles down. Oh, and, sure. And you, you, that's, that's what character development is for me. Mm -hmm. And each acetate is the new draft. Ah, so the, the character sort of reveals itself as you go. Or I figure out what I need him to be. Right. Or her, as the case may be. Because I know in filmmaking, a lot of times um, with uh, characters in a, in a, in a script, um, they'll often give actors um, like a background sheet where uh, none, of, none of that is even going to come up in the film, but it helps the actor uh, make decisions on which direction that character would go. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they arrive fully formed, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, that's fairly rare. But, you know, in a book, I am the actor and I am the director and I'm the set designer. I'm, you know, all of that yeah. is, is, you know, evolves on the page. And frankly, you reverse engineer it sometimes. You know, it's, well, hell, I need to have a door over here. I need to have a building here. Okay, I can go and drop that building in and then right around it. Right. So. Yeah, you're creating uh, the entire world. It, exactly. What power comes with that? That's amazing. Oh, I've killed people and brought them back to life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are your uh, are your main characters good guys? Uh, well, yes. I mean, they are, as they like to say, they're on the side of the angels. They're about justice, but not necessarily about obeying the law. Um, I mean, if you consider, if <clears throat> Jonathan is dispatched to and this has happened in the book, it goes to Indiana to rescue a hostage from bad guys. And he doesn't involve, for a number of reasons, does not involve the locals. He just goes in and the bad guys put up a fight. He kills them. He takes the hostage, reunites him with his family. But from that 
Indiana police department's perspective, there's two unsolved homicides. Oh. So, so is he a good guy or a bad guy? You know, right. he certainly thinks he's a good guy. I think he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. And he has a very strict moral code. You know, he's not an assassin. It's, he's much happier to let people live than to kill them, but doesn't hesitate to kill if he has to. Can we get into uh, when you first started dealing with movie studios? When did you first start dealing with uh, film studios? Well, the um, three days after I sold the rights to Nathan's Run, the publication rights, uh, the auction for the movie rights started. That was a Friday night. And it came down after seven studios were involved in the bidding war. It came down to three: Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers. Wow! And uh, Fox dropped out first, and then it was between Disney and Warner Brothers. And I'm on the phone with my wife. It's ten o'clock Eastern time. We live in Virginia, mm -hmm. so this stuff has happened around seven uh, California time. And finally, when it looks like Disney got it, we were waiting and. And then Warner Brothers came in with an, an offer to beat Disney and then went back and forth. So my agent, whom I didn't know I had, um, introduced himself <laughs> and said, I'm, I'm your I'm CAA and I'm your agent. Said, OK, how did I get you? Yeah. <laughs> so well, your literary agent got me for you. And I said, OK, that's nice. Oh. And uh, so he said, well, if I know it's late where you are, so how about I just bounce them off each other and take the highest offer? And I said, why would I say no to that? Right. And he said, well, maybe you have, maybe you have a preference for producers. I thought, what the hell is a producer? But, <laughs> no, let's go for the money yeah. in this case. So um, <laughs> that movie has never been made. Maybe I should have gone with Disney. Uh, but then I got my, the script for Nathan's Run was terrible for a number of reasons. And I don't want to slam other writers. They just didn't get the story. Mm-hmm. So after about two years, my agent called and said that the, they were putting in a turnaround. I didn't know what that word meant at that point. And when I found out, I, I was mad. I said, I could write a better script, and I've never seen a script. And my agent said, can you do it by next Thursday? And I said, sure. Wow. I had never seen a script. Literally had never seen a script. So I went and I bought Adventures in the Screen Trade by William Goldman, where he has the complete scre uh, script for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in the back. And I looked yes. at it and I thought, I can do this. I got it. It's not that much different than writing a book. So I wrote my own version of the Nathan's Run script, which brought the project out of turnaround for a little while. Mm -hmm. and then, then it went back in. But I had a writing sample. So that led to two gigs with Dino De Laurentiis. Um, I wrote, uh, adapted Nelson DeMille's book, Word of Honor. Wow. And then I adapted Red Dragon, uh, uh, the uh, Thomas Harris book. Yeah. But in adapting the work, I'm ruthless. I mean, it's... Yeah, I believe this is true of my own work. A, a, a film based on a book is not a live action portrayal of the book. It's a whole different art form that's based on a story that started as a book. Right. So when I'm doing the adaptations, um, when I was doing the adaptation for DeMille book, uh, Word of Honor, it was a huge book. It was like 800 pages. And I cut out characters. I did. I, I gave him fewer children. I did. You know, it's because I had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, and without apology, the last person I would have wanted to speak to would have been Nelson DeMille during that <laughs> process. <laughs> now, the, uh, one of your projects that uh, is active in Hollywood right now is Six Minutes to Freedom, right? Can you tell us right. about that? Well, that's a nonfiction book. That's about the uh, Kurt Muse rescue in Panama. Oh, really? So right now it is in very active development. It's um, Mark Boutin with, uh, I think it's Mad River Productions is the name of, of the company. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it is where it is. They're, they're working on the script and, you know, it's, I have been at this spot so many times that I, I have nothing but respect for everybody that's involved. It's just hard to get excited. Mm -hmm. uh, True. When, as as my agent told me years ago, he said, a million things have to go right with nothing going wrong in order to get a movie made. You spent some time on, on the lot. Was it at Paramount or, or in the Warner Brothers? I, I did a little bit. Of, yes. I, I wrote uh, when I was working for uh, John Abnett at uh, um, Baltimore Spring Creek. Uh, we're set up on the Warner lot. 
And and that's just kind of neat. You have your parking space and you you, you feel it's uh, it it's just very heady stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's a bizarre business, but it's it's very cool to be that close. Yeah. I mean, I I imagine uh once one of your stories becomes a film, uh you'll probably be spending more time in Hollywood. Well, I would hope so. Oh yeah. You know, it, it's, you're into it, uh, huh? I am. You know, it's a, it's a sexy place to be. I, I would not move <laughs> there um, right. for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is I've always lived here and this is where my family is. Uh, but it's a fun place to visit. You know, being being put up in the Regent Beverly Wilshire for a month or two at a time, that's not that's not hard. Not too shabby. I enjoy that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with your own books, who is your major sounding board? Is it your editor, your agent? Nobody sees anything, nobody other than myself. Nobody has seen a word of this book yet, nor will they, until I really like it. And then when I really like it, I'll show it to my wife and to my agent. And then if they really like it, then I will send it to my editor. From there, it, it's just a matter of a producer picking up the, the book in an airport and reading it and then searching out the rights. Well, it depends. Like with Six Minutes to Freedom, uh, I was actually in L.A. on had nothing to do with business, actually. And uh, my phone rang and it's a guy named Sam Franco, who's uh, just finished Six Minutes to Freedom. And he said, I'm a movie producer. I'd love to talk to you about uh, turning this into a, a film. And I said, well, you want to have dinner? I'm in L.A. <laughs> so wow. we sat down and we hit it off. And and uh, that was what 10 years ago, I guess. Hmm. But, you know, he optioned it and it's it's forging ahead. Everything takes takes a lot of time. Uh, but I never talk money. I never talk deal points. I do. That's that's what agents do. I right. just I just talk creative stuff. I don't. And that's true on the, the book side, too. I, I only want to talk to my editor about creative stuff. Let my let my agent talk about whether or not Gilstrap's worth that much money. I don't want to hear that. Right. Well, I imagine that's that's the place you want to be. It's just focus on the actual story. Right. Yeah. I think one of the things I would like to talk about. I, I don't. I'm not entirely sure who your demographic is, who, who your audience is. Mm -hmm. But since you've mentioned new writers and and independent filmmakers and, and all of that, I, I just want to double back on something I said before. I talked about character mm -hmm. being the focus, which is by way of saying it's about the story. Uh, right. as, as sort of that, that the old guy who sits in the audience and longs for the old days of, of storytelling. I, I think that the, the computer graphics are great. The, you know, super images are terrific, mm -hmm. but somewhere in, in all of that, what gets lost is the humanity. It's the storytelling until you get, you know, the, the occasional, breakthroughs i think mm -hmm. um uh i just saw a movie called uh, land of mine three words land of mine okay which is a story about um hitler youth pow's in denmark at the end of world war ii Whoa. and it's i don't know they made it for a dollar 95 it's certainly it's a very well done movie but there's there's no big special effects or, mm -hmm. or anything like that and it's in danish i think or German. I don't know the difference, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's all about story. And it's about characters who are doing interesting things. And there's a lot of tension. They're clearing mines off of the beaches of, of Denmark. Oh. And it's, it's fascinating because it tells a good story. So many of the movies like, that, that my son will watch, he's 30, 31. Um, mm -hmm. I find unengaging because it's it's just it's about a lot of movement and and noise so for indies in particular i think that concentration on the interaction and the conflict between humans or somebody that exudes human characteristics they could be you know rabbits or you know whatever mm -hmm. but it's it's really first and foremost about telling a story. It's not about making people gasp with special effects. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so what's the favorite, what do you have a favorite book that you wrote? 
you know what? It's a, it's a throwaway answer, but it's really kind of true. It's always the one I'm writing now. Oh, okay. Because it has to be. Right. That makes sense. You know, other, otherwise, you get into your head. Um, another bit of advice for new writers. Stay out of your head. Quit second guessing. Yes, your first draft sucks. It's supposed to. Mm -hmm. So get over it and keep writing. And uh, the final draft should suck significantly less than the first draft. <laughs> and, and if it doesn't, then maybe you have some issues. But, <laughs> uh, but I think anytime you get into, you know, is this as good as the last one? Or, uh, you know, boy, this. And that's a problem with the second novel, actually. Because mm -hmm. Nathan's Run was a runaway bestseller, it sold in 23 countries, you know, I mean, it was just, it was worldwide. And then you sit down to write the second one and I'm starting and you got to think, well, what is it that people liked about that one? You know, it's, do I need to recreate that story? What's the, and then finally you just kind of have to say, no, stop. It's, they like it because it was a good story, well told, so just do it again. Mm -hmm. In film, they talk about when you're done with the film, uh, it, it's like you gave birth to a baby and you sent it off into the world. Is it like that with books where you're in it and you're in it and then it's out there and you just let it go? Well, I, you make it sound more romantic than the way I feel about it. Okay. Um, usually it's like, finally, I'm an empty nester. You know, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> right. I, I raised this thing and it's gone. I can go and have fun again. Right. Uh, once a book is out there, my opinion, right, people will ask me, well, you know, what do you think? They ask me about plot points. You know, what do you think happened here or what is their motivation or whatever the case may be? Mm -hmm. And my answer is always, what do you think it is? Because my opinion doesn't matter. I had my shot, you know, and if there's ambiguity, maybe it's intentional, maybe it's not intentional, but it's, oh. um, I don't, I have an equal vote. Just because I wrote it doesn't mean that my vote counts more than anybody else's because mm -hmm. it's out there to be perceived. In fact, I was at a, uh, was having drinks with some friends the other day and they had just read, um, Friendly Fire, which was the book from last year. Mm -hmm. And they're having this argument over where there's a big scene that happens at a moose lodge in, in Northern Virginia. And they're going back and forth about where this is located. And, and it's like, I'm not sitting there. Right. And, right. and they're in violent disagreement that no, it's here. And no, no, it's there. The reality is I made it up. Right. And I'm not going to tell them that <laughs> because, you know, let them argue. I think it's a fun argument to have, but it doesn't exist anywhere. So how many more of the Jonathan Grave stories do you have in you? Uh, as, as many as contracts require. <laughs> well, and th the way I've created his world, and mm -hmm. this was done intentionally in No Mercy is the first book in the, in the series. Um, Jonathan is wealthy because his dad was a criminal and is now in prison. He's a, the patriarch of a residential school for the children of incarcerated parents called Resurrection House. Um, so mm -hmm. there's that whole universe of the children of criminals. So if I need to milk that, I got a story there that I can, I can figure out. Um, so yeah, there's always a story out there. Now, having said that, I have no idea what next year's grave book is going to be. Did, uh, did quitting ever cross your mind? Do you ever think about throwing in the towel? Well, yeah. I mean, there was, after Nathan's run, the first book sold for an enormous amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, and then at all costs, sold for more money. But it was before Nathan's run had been published yet. And the, the numbers that are involved were such that they, it couldn't possibly earn out. I mean, I'd had to sell 350,000 copies in hardcover. It, wow. in order to earn out the advance. So what had happened was the, the, the publishers overpaid, which is great. I get to keep the check. Sure. And, uh, but there was some buyer's remorse. And then, you know, for even Stephen and Scott Free, the third and fourth books, the advances were significantly less and yada, yada publishing stuff happened. I got orphaned by my, my editor four times. So then when, uh, after the fourth book, I couldn't give a book away. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just the nature of the entertainment business. You know, if, if something doesn't make money, it's the artist's fault. And I, I don't say that with bitterness. It's just, that's the way of the entertainment business. Sure. And, 
Um, I remember being at a, a conference in 2003 or four, and a very good friend of mine, uh, who's whose career started when Maya started and just went meteoric. And she came up to me in a, the bar in the conference and she said, I'm so sorry to hear what happened to your career. And I oh. thought, well, what happened to my career? And, it, and what I realized was that the industry and the participants in the industry had written me off. And, uh, it's a very small community. I mean, no, there are no secrets in this community. Hmm. But I wasn't done yet. I didn't think. And then Six Minutes to Freedom came along, which was the nonfiction book. Right. And some of the movie gigs came along. So I, I was always making a living. But um, the Six Minutes to Freedom was the reset to because it sold really well. Nobody had any expectations for it. But it sold like hotcakes, mostly on military basis. But they buy a lot of books on military basis. Yeah. So, you know, the lesson, I, this is actually the subject of a keynote that I do, uh, where I go into far more detail in this stuff, but the takeaway from the keynote, and maybe this is something for the, the audience to remember, failure cannot be inflicted. The reality is failure has to be declared by the individual. Right. And I refused to quit. It's one of the things I am most proud of is... I refused to quit. And then, you know, the first grave book, when I came back, it was, um, it was a tiny percentage of what I got for, um, the early books, mm -hmm. but the publisher believed in it and they believed in me and they worked hard for me. And now, you know, it's, they're going gangbusters again and, and I'm back and I just won best novel of the year from international thriller writers association, which by the way, is the same conference I was at when the author friend said, I'm so sorry, what happened to your career? Wow. And you know what? You, you don't know how long the rocket ship ride is going to last. Sure. I, I have been fortunate. I've, I've been at the top of the sine curve. I've been at the bottom of the sine curve. It's, I love it much more at the top than at the bottom. But the bottom is where you discover, are you, are you in this for the money? Are you in this because you really want to, to do it? Do you really want to tell stories? Right. Well, John, thanks. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for sharing your stories about your stories. I urge everybody to go to johngillstrap.com to get more information about his books or his uh, speaking engagements. Um, thank you, John. You're very welcome. Anytime. Well, that's that. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Indie Film Grit podcast. Feel free to go to the website and check out the show notes, indiefilmgrit.com. And follow us on Twitter, at Indie Film Grid. And don't forget, subscribe to us on iTunes. Trust me, it's a good idea. Well, I should really wrap this up, but before I go, let me ask you something. Do you have the courage, the passion, and the perseverance to make indie films? Do you have enough indie film grid?